April 18, 1942, dawned bright and clear in Tokyo. Officials prepared for a civil defense drill to be held later that morning. But no one believed that American bombers could reach Japan, and most people just went about their business. Early in the morning, our task force went between two Japanese picket ships 650 miles out. Actually, they were fishing vessels equipped with radios to report just the sort of thing they saw that morning. Two carriers and four cruisers heading for Japan. And before they were sunk, our people realized that they had been able to radio into the main islands of Japan that this task force was heading for. Halsey wrote, although we were 600 miles from Tokyo, instead of the 400 that we had hoped for, the fact that our task force had been reported left me no choice. At 0800, I sent Pete Mitcher a signal, launch planes, and to Colonel Doolittle and his gallant command, good luck and God bless you. Halsey ordered the cruiser Nashville to sink the Japanese picket ship, the Nito Maru. In rough seas, Nashville's crew fired 924 six-inch shells, but scored just one hit on the picket boat. The Japanese raised a white flag and their ship promptly sank. Early in the morning, most of us were probably below deck. We could hear that the gun was going out. And it, almost immediately, it seemed like they announced over the speaker that Army pilots man, man your planes. So they had to pack up our uh, bag and get up to the airplane as soon as possible. Like everybody else, uh, it was around, I think, six o'clock when we uh, got up. Some of us were down in the, having breakfast. The first real notification was when the Nashville opened up on the Nita Maru. I, for one, wanted to make sure that I arrived at the airplane before Colonel Doolittle. Well, he, I was the second lieutenant and he was a, a lieutenant colonel and I didn't want to uh, get uh, verbally lambasted for being late. And the other thing is that uh, I wanted to get up in the airplane and go through the checklist and have a lot of the things that I, I could do that he wouldn't have to worry about. We're pretty much in takeoff uh, uh, position when Colonel Doolittle came. Doolittle called all the crews on deck and went over their instructions one more time. He offered the men one more chance to step down. There were no takers. Several backup crew members begged for a chance to take someone's place on the mission. Again, no takers. One of the backup pilots did find a place on the mission. Robert Height's plane had been left behind at Alameda in San Francisco. I always thought that Dad was co-pilot of plane 16. Well, originally he was pilot of one of the four planes that couldn't fit on the, on the aircraft carrier. And that Bill Farrow didn't apparently didn't get along with his co-pilot, or his co-pilot decided that he didn't want to go, and Bill came and, and asked my father to fly with him. Robert Height, co-pilot of plane number 16, would be captured by the Japanese and would spend three and a half years in captivity. Mitcher turned the Hornet directly into the wind and ordered full speed ahead. Well, the, the weather, uh, it was, uh, the, the ocean was uh, very, very rough. It, uh, water was coming up over the deck of the carrier. Launching early meant the planes would have farther to go and need more fuel, but their fuel tanks were already full after I got in the airplane, they handed me up a, a dozen five-gallon cans of gasoline. Then, before we got to Japan, they used the gasoline out of that turret tank first. Then I was able to dump the gasoline out of the one dozen cans into the turret tank. Then I cut a, used a crash axe to cut a hole in each end of the empty cans and I kicked them out the window. 
I did that so they would sink immediately instead of leaving a trail across the ocean from the direction we'd come. Doolittle's plane was the first to take off. It was at the start line, brakes locked, engines running at 8.20 that morning. The Navy signalman was twirling his flag to give him the signal to when to take off. They'd run the engines up full power and the signalman could tell from the sound of the engines when they were at full power. So then when the bow of the carrier was at the lowest spot, closest to the water, he, he uh, dro dropped to the deck and, and swung a flag forward and that's when they're supposed to start rolling. Then by the time the airplane got to the end of the bow, or the top of the bow, the, air, the carrier, the bow of the carrier was as far as from, as from the water as it could be, so that gave them that much distance between the water and the bow of the carrier. I was in plane number nine. There was a, probably 200 feet or more of clear deck ahead of us, but each one of us were pulled up to that same line. We all had 400 feet to take off. And one reason that they did that was because our right wing tip just missed the island by about six feet. And our left wheel then was about six feet from the edge of the carrier deck. So if we veered to the right or left in a longer takeoff run, we might uh, hit the right wing or the, le or the left wheel overboard. So we all took off from the same place. And we all got airborne as, as planned. And uh, it, was, it was a little uh, exciting at first, but plane number nine that I was on, by the time it was our turn, we were feeling pretty brave about the whole thing. Eight planes had successfully negotiated the takeoff ahead of us. I would bet that uh, the, top, the average flight time for the pilots on the, uh, on the mission was probably about 500 hours, and in the B-25, maybe 100 hours. So it was, they were, by modern standards, terribly undertrained. But by their standards, they were good. They were proficient. They could fly instruments. They could fly uh, formation, and they, they knew the nature of the mission. I, I, I think that all of them went in knowing exactly what was at risk. Their lives were at risk, but it was worth it. It was the mission they were assigned to do. In his autobiography, Admiral Halsey wrote, the wind and sea were so strong that morning that green water was breaking over the carrier's ramps. Jimmy led his squadron off. When his plane buzzed down the Hornet's deck at 0825, there wasn't a man topside in the task force who didn't help sweat him into the air. One pilot hung on the brink of a stall until we nearly cataloged his effects, but the last of the 16 was airborne by 0924. And a minute later, my staff duty officer was writing in the flag log, commencing retirement from the area at 25 knots. Here, let me say that in my opinion, their flight was one of the most courageous deeds in all military history. When the aircraft carrier Hornet turned into the westerly wind to launch the bombers, it pointed almost directly at Tokyo Bay. Now, each plane went in on its own. It took, takes gas and, and time to, uh, to form in formation. So each plane was on its own. We didn't have gas to waste in, in getting together in formation. So we were about four or five minutes apart, which meant that in most cases, we never saw another B-25 uh, on that day. Now, well, when we took off 650 miles out, there was a solid overcast and high winds, and as we proceeded towards Japan, about two hours, all that cleared up, and we had a nice sunny day for the rest of the day, way into late afternoon. It was nice and sunny, so we got a big break there. But we went in right on the deck so the radar couldn't pick us up so easily. Flying inbound uh, to, to Japan, they, they were had no idea of what the Japanese intercept capabilities were. They knew that they had been detected, and so they were ob obviously cautious. The, the technique would be to fly low and fast, but uh, the faster you go, the more fuel you use. So they had to compromise in, in their uh, cruise control techniques to, to fly a, a reasonable speed to get them and get them over Japan and subsequently over China. 
Uh, I think that the uh, average pilot flying it was probably exhilarated because it's, it's fun to fly at relatively low levels. And the average co-pilot uh, was probably concerned, A, that he wasn't getting enough stick time, and, and B, that uh, he had to make sure that the engines weren't uh, getting too hot because he's running the mixtures too lean. The mixture is extremely important when you're trying to get mileage out of your airplane. You're not care you don't care anymore about speed particularly, you're caring about getting a distance out of the engines. So they all practice cruise control in that sense. The fuel situation was made even worse by the additional fuel tanks, one in the belly and one over the bomb bay of each bomber. The tanks had been poorly designed and poorly built and they leaked from every corner and from every connection. On every one of the 16 planes, fuel critical to the mission was leaking away. Once they were off the carrier, the crews faced about three and a half hours of flying time to Japan. They were barely flying, 150 to 160 miles per hour, just above stall speed. They were flying 15 to 30 feet off the water. As the excitement of the launch wore off, they thought about the mission ahead. Most of the crews agreed that they didn't have enough fuel to reach China. Aboard plane number nine, navigator Tom Griffin calculated just how far their fuel would take them. And our best calculations were that after about five hours, we were going to run out of gas and we were going to be short of uh, China by about 100 to 150 miles. So I think all of the planes made some kind of a decision. In our plane, we thought, well, we're going to be running out of gas. If we see a ship, we'll ditch next to it and they'll take us aboard. And if it's a friendly ship, fine, we'll sail off with them. If it's an unfriendly ship, we each had 45s, and we'll pull out our 45s and take over the ship. Those, you have to have a light at the end of the tunnel, and that was the light we had. Spread out over some 500 square miles of open ocean, the 16 bombers were heading for targets in Tokyo, Yokohama, Yokosuku, Nagoya, and Kobe. The Japanese people had been told that they were invulnerable. Months of victories had demonstrated that destiny, the gods, and military might were on the side of the emperor. Above all, they believed their homeland was safe from attack. Sixteen American planes and 80 brave men were about to prove otherwise. Dick Cole was the co-pilot of plane number one, which was piloted by Colonel Doolittle. We launched at uh, about 8.20 in the morning. It put us over Tokyo at uh, right around noon. We shored into Japan about 20 miles north. Uh, we could see Tokyo Bay, and uh, we turned south and took us on a course over Tokyo east of the Imperial Palace. We had incendiary bombs. And the reason was that uh, since we were supposed to launch at dusk on the 19th, arrive over Tokyo, drop the incendiary bombs and light up Tokyo so that uh, it would uh, cause a big fire. Also, it would give the following airplanes uh, a, some kind of a reference to where they wanted to go. But having the launch early put us over Tokyo in the middle of the day on the 18th. A couple of things that may have helped us, uh, the Japanese had just practiced an air raid exercise. And they had a bomber called the Betty that had two tails and uh, for the first airplane, uh, we feel that um, a lot of the people on the ground thought it was uh, one of their airplanes when they saw the B-25. Because uh, we were not jumped by any other airplane. Uh, we flew low level till Fred Bramer uh, recognized uh, uh, from photographs that uh, they had given us on the carrier. Uh, 
At that time, Colonel Doolittle pulled up to 1,500 feet and we dropped our incendiary bomb. And immediately we went back down on the deck. Uh, the ACAC opened up on us and it was pretty intense, but it was not accurate. Of the 16 Mitchell bombers, only two made landfall where they expected. Inaccurate compasses, overcast skies, and a 40-knot headwind made accurate navigation impossible. Once the planes were over Japan, all 16 navigators were able to lead their planes to their targets, but getting lost even briefly burned precious fuel. And the Japanese knew they were coming. Picket boats guarding the coast and patrol planes sent out to search for the Nito Maru had spotted the inbound raiders several hundred miles out. When we were over Tokyo, we had counted uh, 37 airplanes above us. And uh, they did not see us. Civilians who saw the Mitchells mistook them for Japanese planes. The morning air raid drill had been ignored by most of the populace, and they assumed that the low-flying bombers were just part of the exercise. As we came over the coast, uh, it was Saturday, right at noon, beautiful day. There were a lot of people on the beach. They were waving to us. And, uh, and I, we were flying so low, I could see the expression on their faces. They were cheering. I'm sure they thought we were Japanese airplanes. We followed the Japanese coast all the way southwest until we got to the tip of Japan and then headed west to China. Plane number eight, still burning too much fuel, hit its target, a factory north of Tokyo. As they sped away on the deck, pilot Ski York, co-pilot Robert Emmons, and navigator Nolan Herndon discussed their options. The Russian city of Vladivostok was 600 miles north. Although Doolittle had ordered that no one land in Russia, the crew of plane number eight felt they had little choice. York turned the bomber north. And when we got over the city of Tokyo itself, we went in at rooftop level till we got to what we call our initial point where we pulled up to 1,500 feet to make our bombing run on our assigned target. Plane number nine happened to just fly right over Hirohito's house at about 50 feet. And uh, then we proceeded down to the uh, northern section of uh, Tokyo Bay and headed across to bomb our target which was a factory in the Kawasaki district of Tokyo making uh, tanks. And uh, we made our bomb run. The bombardier in the nose and the top turret gunner could see what our bombs did. The pilot and co-pilot and I couldn't tell, so we had to take their word for it. But they said that we really flattened that target. There was flak in the sky everywhere, and there were Japanese Zeros flying around. And uh, we went in right at rooftop level, which made it very difficult for them to attack us. And they had flak towers, uh, and they had to depress their guns to shoot at our people. And I actually saw their shells exploding in the street as, as we went across the city as they were shooting at us. Despite clouds of anti-aircraft fire and swarms of Japanese fighter planes, all 16 Mitchells hit their targets and raced away undamaged. Getting lost on the way in had an unexpected benefit. The bombers hit Tokyo from every possible direction and the Japanese defenses were thrown into chaos. 15 Mitchells and their crews now headed for China, across the China Sea. Most of them doubted that their remaining fuel would get them there. Behind them, Tokyo burned. Admiral Halsey later wrote, We had our radios tuned to Tokyo. One of their glibest liars came on and began describing, in English, the wonders of life in Japan. Of all the warring countries in the world, he said, Japan alone was free from enemy attack. It would continue so. Indeed, Japan was blessed among nations. And right there, we heard the air raid sirens. Jimmy's boys had arrived. We were captured by the Japanese. 
and they carried us back to Japan, and and so they gave us uh, court martials and all of that, and they condemned us to death, and then uh, they decided to let us live. They executed three of the pilots, and so that left the rest of us with a with the uh, possibility that we could be later on could be executed any time. So I kept walking, and at dusk I came out on a cliff, and down below I saw a little cantonment of a couple of buildings that had a Chinese nationalist uh, flag flying up above it. On the table was a sketch of a, on a piece of paper of a two-tailed airplane with five parachutes coming out of it. And uh, the pilot had a deep gash in his left leg and one in his left arm, and most of his teeth had been knocked out. The co-pilot had a, a gash in his le right, right leg, and I had used the, uh, had to get, use some old dirty rags to try to close up the cuts on the, the other wounds. So when we knew we were over the, uh, the, the rim of the uh, China, we pulled up to 11,000 feet or 10,000 to clear any mountains in that part of China. And then as we ran out of gas, we just bailed out. By the time we got up there going into China, we could not let down. It was nighttime, we were in a big storm, and there were mountains below us. So all we could do was to head into that storm, run out of gas, and bail out. That's what 11, 55 men bailed out of 11 planes. Just four months after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Dick Cole was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot in the first Army Air Force B-25 light bomber to launch from the aircraft carrier Hornet. The 16 airplanes streamed to the Japanese homeland and successfully bombed Tokyo targets. Cole survived bailing out of their stricken aircraft over China and went on to fly the treacherous Himalaya Mountains, supplying our Chinese allies battling the Japanese in China. Soon after that, he was part of the very first air commando units of our air forces. After his long and highly decorated Air Force career, Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole passed away recently at age 103. He was the last surviving member of the Doolittle Raiders. Dick, um, start us off, would you? There you were in the right seat of the B-25, yeah. the lead airplane to leave yeah. the aircraft carrier, April 18, 1942. <laughs> and in the left seat, Lieutenant Colonel and Lieutenant Colonel, um, Jimmy Doolittle. Um, what kind of a man was he, and how well did you know him at that point, Dick? Well, they was, uh, uh, back in 1990, uh, I had written some uh, little notes uh, concerning my thoughts about Colonel Doolittle. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, no, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> He's always ahead of you, all the time. Uh, actually, Colonel Doolittle was five foot six, but uh, the way I, I was able to put it together was he was short in stature but tall on accomplishment. A man of integrity, honor, and courage. He excluded confidence, determination, and strength. He was intelligent, educated, and humble. Great respect for others. 
led by example and inspiration to all, and we would have followed him anywhere. I, for one, wanted to make sure that I arrived at the airplane before Colonel Doolittle. Well, he, I was the second lieutenant, and he was the uh, lieutenant colonel, and I didn't want to uh, get uh, verbally lambasted for being late. I want you to know that uh, uh, the Raiders really appreciate your loyalty over the years. And uh, uh, their word, again, thank you uh, for uh, being here today and having fun. This airplane belongs, this Panchito belongs to Larry Kelly. He's from Enterprise, Alabama. He's got quite a resume, but I'm not going to go into it. He has 4,000 hours. He's been with the DAV flight team for 10 years. Now, what I'd like to do is Larry's going to tell us a little bit about the history of the B-25 and then about the particular airplane itself. Here, Larry. Thank you, Sam. Happy birthday. You. you don't look that old. <laughs> uh, this particular airplane uh, is not the original airplane that carried the Panchito nose art. Uh, this particular airframe was built in October 1944 in the last contract series North American had manufactured in Kansas City, Kansas, where all the J models and the H models were manufactured. The, the B models that the Raiders flew were all manufactured out in California. Then later, the C models were manufactured in California. The D models uh, in Kansas City along with all the J and uh, H models. The G model you hear about was actually a D model. It was converted, had the cannon added to it. The H models came out of the factory with the cannons in the nose. A uh, 75 millimeter artillery piece mounted in the crawlway going up to the bombardier's nose. Uh, but this airframe, uh, built in October 1944, entered service in January 1945 and was used as a crew transition trainer. Now what that means is Pilots had just finished pilot training and gotten their wings. Bombardiers just gotten their wings. Gunners had just gotten theirs. Everybody just finished their trade schools and their technical schools would be brought together as a crew, and they would be assigned an airplane at a training base or a transition base where they would learn to their fighting skills as a crew. They'd go out and do bombing practice, strafing practice, and learn to practice together, and then be shipped off to the theater of war to become replacement crews in the different theaters around the war. Uh, other crews would get in the airplanes, and that would just repeat over and over and over again at these transition bases. Now, the original Panchito, built in the same lot number as this airplane, or same batch number, I guess you could say, 
uh, was assigned to the 41st Bomb Group and was flown to Hawaii in uh, early January 1945. And the 41st Bomb Group had already seen service down in the Central Pacific, uh, had done their job there. The Japanese were pretty much defeated in that area where they were, where they were assigned. So the 41st was brought back to Hawaii to get outfitted with new crews and newer airplanes. They had G models uh, down in the uh, South Pacific, and they were getting the new J models. Everybody knew by then that it was only a matter of time before the Japanese had defeated, and the 41st was going to be one of the outfits going to Okinawa to be assigned for the softening up of the Japanese. And uh, at the time the airplane was assigned, Don Seiler was a senior combat pilot in the 396 Bomb Squadron. You'll see his name painted under the wing up here, or under the, uh, the cockpit window. And uh, uh, Don had volunteered for a second, uh, second tour, and his buddy Ben Tarnoskis, he'd gone through all the training with, had volunteered for a second tour. They went to the base theater. They saw a movie called The Three Caballeros. And they could see themselves, one, as the suave green parrot who was the ladies' man. That was Karaoke Joe. Any of you that's seen the movie, it was uh, one of Disney's feel-good animated musicals in World War II. And Don Seiler could see himself as Panchito, that high-energy Mexican rooster with the two six-guns. And so he painted Panchito on his airplane. Karaoke Joe was painted the other one. Off they went to uh, Okinawa, uh, began their combat operations in the late, uh, late spring of 1945. But just for a little perspective, at that time, Don Seiler was 22 years old, and he was a senior combat pilot in the 396 Bomb Squadron. He was the guy the new guys had to fly with before they could fly missions on their own. Uh, so that's where the name came from. All the 41st Bomb Group at the end of the war, uh, all were ordered to go to Clark Field. The airplanes were lined up, blown up, and the debris was bulldozed into ravines, big ho dugout holes that were done there on Clark Field. And there the remains of the original Panchito remain, except for the eight-day clock, which sits on the mantle of Bill Miller's house. Bill passed away last year, though he was the last surviving original crew member. Uh, the difference is, some of you have been asked many times, between the J model and the B models that the Raiders flew, same basic airframe, same basic engines. A lot more armament was added later on. The package guns were not on the early ones. That's the guns on the side. Uh, the guys had one 30 caliber machine gun in the nose that could stick from one hole to the other. Uh, David, had, David Thatcher here had a uh, uh, one turret mounted just after the bomb bay, a Bendix turret with two 50 caliber guns in it that occasionally would work, most often wouldn't work, right, David? <laughs> and uh, did you have trouble with yours on the raid? Did yours work? Not very well. N not very well. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway... Uh, and then the, they had very little armor. They didn't have the waist gun positions in the original B models, and in the later J models, it just kept adding more and more as the airplane evolved more from a medium altitude bombing role, which wasn't designed for, more into low altitude, uh, much like the A-10 is used for today. You can imagine all these fixed guns, and with the eight-gun strafer version, where you had eight 50 calibers in the nose, plus the others, you could get 14 50 caliber guns firing forward for strafing, you put four or five of these things side by side, you could do a lot of damage to a Jap airfield or a train or uh, uh, troop emplacements. Uh, dropping parafrags as you pass over, strafing on the way out, so evolve more into the A-10 type role for today. Uh, Sam, would you want to introduce the Raiders? And yes. On my left, we have the co-pilot from the number one airplane with General Doolittle. says, this is Colonel Cole. Now, I have a little information on Colonel Cole here, and it, uh, I'll try to make it too short. Not too short, but well enough to talk about it. But he was went in the military in uh, November the 22nd, 1940. As I said, he was in ship number one on the raid of April, April the 18th, 1942. After the raid, he served in the China-Burma-India Theater, and it's June the 43, June the 44. The decorations of the Flying Cross, the DFC, with two Oak Leaf Clusters, the Air Medal with one Oak Leaf Cluster, the Bronze Star, Air Force Commendation Medal, the Chinese Medal Class A First Grade. On my right is Master Sergeant David Thatcher. He was ship number seven, which is a unique, new, unique ship in, in a couple of ways. Number one is when you see the movie and you'll see one uh, that they take off and it sinks down and it almost hits the water, that was ship number seven. They uh, somehow, well, uh, there's a reason behind it, and Sergeant Thatcher will tell you that they 
why they, they ended up with the flaps up when they should have been down. But it was the ruptured duck, the pilot was Ted Lawson, and he wrote 30 seconds over Tokyo. Sergeant Thatcher was in the Army. He started in December the 3rd, 1940, went to mechanical school, A&E, in December of, of 41. And after the raid, he served in England and Africa. His decorations are he was one of two raiders that received the Silver Star, DFC Air Medal, Four Oak Leaf Clusters, and Chinese Army Class A first grade. And we'll get into this Silver Star, how he was earned, awarded, however you want to put it, the Silver Star later on in, the, in our uh, interview here. And Larry just talked about the B-25 in particular. And before I get started on the interview, I'd like to say that after we get through with this, please, you people, just stay in your seats until these, till these gentlemen can get back over to the Warbirds in review, review uh, tent over here for the, uh, for the sales. And they'll be there. And we have some items. They have prints there of their own that they're selling. They will be signing. All that money goes to an education fund. Uh, there are three books over there that are uh, Jimmy Doolittle's uh, autobiography. Uh, there's two about the raid. There's also a DVD that you people may have seen or may not have seen that's, uh, that was on the military channel. Uh, and uh, so those, those items are over there, and they will be over there to, to autograph those items. And also, we'd like to have you members, the people that are not members of the Warbirds of America, uh, we're not all airplane owners. 90% uh, of the people here are not our airplane owners. They just support the Warbirds. And we try to welcome you if you come in. We have an excellent magazine that comes out once a month. So now we've got through with all the commercial. I'd, I'd like to ask Colonel Cole, the first, first question, sir, is uh, how were you selected, number one, for the, for the group, number two in particular, how were you selected to be the co-pilot and what was your training? I think it's on. Uh, actually, it wasn't a matter of selection. Uh, it was a case of, of uh, just incidents happening. Uh, I was screwed up with a senior pilot uh, and in the middle of our training, he became ill uh, and that left us without a pilot. Uh, I had been upgraded uh, as a pilot, but uh, was just recently, uh, uh, and uh, I didn't feel confident enough to try to go as the first pilot. So uh, the crew talked it over, and I went to the ops officer, and uh, he said, well, uh, the old man's coming in this afternoon, and uh, I'll crew you up with him. And I thought, well, uh, now we get to fly with an old man. Maybe that's uh, not such a good idea. But um, <laughs> uh, I had never heard a captain talk about uh, his uh, commander as the old man. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, I was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio, and I know who uh, Jimmy Doodle was because uh, I had a scrapbook uh, with uh, all his uh, flying experiences. Uh, he came in that afternoon about uh, one o'clock, and uh, by two o'clock, uh, we were on our way to Lakeland, Florida, uh, for some business that he had to do. And uh, from there, we went to Washington, to Bowling Field, and back to Wright Field, and then back down to Eglin. And uh, uh, he, he didn't fire us, so uh, we turned out to be his crew. Well, what was, it, what was your training after you, you got down to, to Eglin? What, how did you, what, what consisted of your training? The main part of the training um, consisted of uh, a young Navy pilot from Pensacola instructing us on how to make a uh, short carrier takeoff. Uh, 
it turned out that uh, when all the airplanes were on the deck, uh, we would end up with about 449 feet uh, to uh, get off in. Uh, his name was uh, Hank Miller. He was a very good instructor, and uh, uh, he uh, judged each crew. Uh, and uh, in uh, Doodle's case, uh, he he qualified in three attempts, and uh, uh, from then on, uh, our training was uh, low-level navigation and night navigation. Uh, bombing and uh, uh, the navigators were uh, given a crash course in uh, celestial navigation and the bombardiers and uh, uh, gunners uh, if the turret would work or uh, they got some training uh, work in the, uh, tr the uh, turret and that was about it. Uh, Originally, uh, Colonel Doolittle wanted to make sure that uh, all the crews got uh, 50 hours of training, but uh, I think it ended up more around uh, 30 hours. And uh, incidentally, uh, uh, when they asked for volunteers, uh, there was the uh, Bob White, Tom White, uh, was the squadron doctor. And I, he wanted to go, but Colonel Doolittle told him he didn't have space for him. Uh, the only spaces available were for uh, turret operators. Well, somewhile, uh, somehow, uh, Tom White got a, a space in the uh, turret uh, training uh, field. I don't know how he did it, but he he uh, qualified on the, the turret and ended up flying as a gunner on one of the airplanes. Which is going to lead to uh, another story later on in there because he also he was the other recipient of the Silver Star, uh, Sergeant Thatcher. When you now. When you finished your training down there, you ended up going to Sacramento, is that correct? And you were there yes. for quite some, some yeah. time, and yeah. I understand that was not a very pleasant experience maintenance-wise, is that correct? That's right, yes. Our home base had been at Pendleton, Oregon, and on the way to Columbia, South Carolina, the airplanes were modified at Minneapolis. The bottom turret was removed, we knew that no enemy fighter could get underneath of us flying that low. And there was a 60-gallon tank put in there where the bottom turret was. And at the top of the bomb bay, they put a, tur a tank in there, and we still had room for four or 500-pound bombs. There's a crawlway between the top of the bomb bay and the top of the airplane. They put a collapsible rubber tank in there. After we got to uh, Columbia, South Carolina, then we were, uh, selected the crews. So I was, got, was able to get on one of the crews there. And I went to Eglin Field, Florida, made her intensive training there. I had the 250 caliber machine guns in the turret, and then there was a flexible 30 in the nose. We also had two black painted broomstick in the tail for a detergent. Uh, on the way, uh, after, before I got on the airplane, they handed me up a, a dozen five-gallon cans of gasoline, so we were pretty well loaded. When I got on, on up in the airplane, uh, the wind was blowing across the deck so hard I couldn't stand up, so we had plenty of lift to get off. I guess we did take off without our, without our flaps. That's how we disappeared over the bow of the carrier. When he took off, uh, they uh, transferred the gasoline, used that in the turret tank first, and then I was able to pour the gasoline out of the five-gallon cans into the turret tank. Then I used the crash axe to 
cut a hole in each end of the empty cans and kicked them out the window. I did that so they would sink immediately instead of leaving a trail behind us. As we approached the coast of Japan, it happened to be a, a beautiful day, Saturday, right at noon. As we passed over the beach, the people were waving to us. We were flying so low I could see the expressions on their faces. They were cheering. Between the coast and before we reached to Tokyo, uh, we met a, a flight of six planes. But we were flying so low, they didn't, they didn't see us. They just kept on going. As we approached Tokyo, there was quite a bit of anti-aircraft fire, but it wasn't very accurate. We had to climb from our cruising altitude of about 50 feet up to 1,500 feet to drop our bombs. Our target was a Nippon steel factory in Tokyo. We had three 500-pound demolition, 300-pound uh, demolition bombs and, and one 500-pound incendiary cluster. After dropping our bombs, we just dived back down over Tokyo Bay and headed southwest. We could see the uh, mainland of Japan, but we were flying over the water. And finally, when we reached the southern tip of Japan, then we tur turned west to China. We were in there 13 hours that day. So when we reached China, we were nearly out of fuel. It was dark, almost dark and it was raining, and the pilot spotted a strip of beach to try to set the, the airplane down on. But we hit the water with the wheels down and immediately stopped and flipped us over. The other four of the, guy, the, other four of the crew were all thrown out to the nose when we hit. I was in the back end and knocked unconscious for a short time and then was able to get out through the escape hatches then up on the top of the airplane. When I stepped off the tail of the airplane in the water, it was about waist deep. So the, when I got out, the other, other four of the crew were already up on the beach. The pi uh, navigator was kneeling between the pilot and co-pilot's armor plated seats when he went out. The bombardier was in the tunnel, I guess. He went out head first through the bombardier's n nose. And the pilot and co-pilot, when they came to in the water, they were still strapped to their armor-plated seats. But they got up on the beach. Soon they would see some people up on the, on a, the bench there. Up on the, and we didn't know if they were Chinese or Japanese. We happened to land on a Japanese-occupied island. But there weren't any Japanese there at the time, so the Chinese underground helped us out of there. That next morning after the crash, uh, all the other four crew members were so badly injured, they had to be carried. I was the only one that was very badly hurt. It took us um, all that day and an, that night to get across the island. We found out later that the Atlanta Company Japanese soldiers on that spot of beach where we landed four hours after we left there, we had a head, out, head start on them so they never caught up with us. Then we went across in a sampan to the mainland at Haiyu, and it took us two days to get there, and then another day to get to the hospital at Lin Hai. There was a doctor and his son were also a doctor, and that was the first medical treatment we were able to get after, after being a Christ. The pilot was, had a very bad gash in his left leg, so he was, by the time he got to the hospital, an infection had set in, and he was, had to get his leg amputated there at that hospital. We were there three days, and crew number 15, Made a good water landing. They got their life raft out, got all the equipment into the life raft. But in landing, a sharp corner, the flap turned up, and it punctured half the life raft and dumped everything in the water. <laughs> they were able to cling to the life raft and get to shore, and the underground were able to get them up to the hospital where we were. 
We stayed there three days, and then Doc White happened to be on that crew. So he stayed there with my crew, and I went on with crew number 15, worked our way inland. The Chinese had blown up all the highways along the coast to slow the advance of the Japanese, so all we had was trails through the rice paddies to, to travel for three or four days walking and being carried. It took us uh, until about the, uh, uh, we finally got to Lin, um, Hayu on the Yangtze River, pretty good sized city. We were there three days, every morning would, air raid siren would go off and we'd go down to the dock and get on a, ter a ferry and go up the river a couple miles and get out on shore and there was a fairly high hill there with a pagoda on top of it, about seven stories high, so we'd go up, took, go up in there and over there we could see the, bom the Japanese bombers come over the city and the airport dropping bombs and then that, it would uh, just, uh, you could hear them emptying machine guns over the city and nothing, no target in particular. The only protection that Chinese had was old German World War I mousing rifles. So the Japs knew that they couldn't reach that far. The fourth morning, a C-47, a cargo plane, came in from Chongqing to pick us up. That, that day, the Japanese came over and strafed and bombed that pagoda. They had spies through there. They knew what they were doing. We finally reached Chongqing. And uh, we were there about three days, and that time uh, Madame Chiang Kai-shek had a banquet for us and presented us with a Chinese medal. Then from there, we let, let, uh, flew out of the, over the hump to Calcutta, was there last 10 days of May waiting for orders, then went to uh, New Delhi for a few days and then to Karachi. And there I received my orders to come back to the United States. So we came through Iraq, Cairo, across Central Africa to Nigeria, and then flew across the South Atlantic to Brazil in a Pan American Clipper. From there we worked our way up to Washington, D.C., went all the way around the world that trip. We were decorated in Washington, D.C. with distinguished flying crosses, Went back to Billings to, for a couple of days leave and then reported to MacDill Field in Tampa, Florida and began training in B-26s. Trained there until the last of September of 42 and went by train to New York and boarded the Queen Mary. It had been converted to a troop ship. There were 12,000 troops on board that, that uh, trip. They had bunk beds stacked five high. It went across the North Atlantic alone. It changed course every three miles. And uh, at 90 degrees to avoid submarines. Off the coast of Ireland, a dozen U U.S. and British destroyers met us to escort us into Glasgow, Scotland. This one destroyer cut across in front of the Queen Mary twice, looking for submarines. The third time, the, the Queen Mary cut it in two. You can just feel a bump. That Queen Mary is so big. So we finally got into Glasgow, and then went by train down to south uh, east of London to Norwich. We were there several months. And the, uh, at night, the German bombers would come over our base on their way to London, but they didn't bother us because we didn't have any airplanes there. Then last of December, I went in a convoy to Oran, Algeria, North Africa. At the first, until the middle of April, we were flying submarine patrol back and forth across the Mediterranean between Oran and the coast of Spain. We had depth charges in our bomb bay then. April, we moved up to the front. We were bombing the uh, Italians and the Germans. Finally got uh, Rommel kicked out of North Africa. Then we could uh, reach the 
island of Sardinia and island of Sicily. And I was on 26 bombing missions over there, including the first raid on Rome. I was there until December of 43, and then returning to, from there back to Casablanca, and boarded the Empress of Japan. It was the Japanese ocean liner that had been captured early in the war and was converted to a troop ship. And I'll come back to New York on that. Colonel Colt, uh, thank you very much. That was very, <laughs> very moving. Colonel Colt, you read that uh, it was considered a suicide mission. Did, did you feel like that it, it was a suicide mission before you proceeded on this? Uh, I don't know who thought that up, but uh, I think it was wrong. Because uh, uh, personally, I didn't believe that it was any more of a suicide mission than the guys taking off from England flying over Germany. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when you go on a combat mission, uh, you uh, uh, think about the bad things that happen, and the one of them is that you might not come back. So, but. Uh, you uh, to keep your morale up, boy. You don't use the word suicide. <laughs> that, of course, you were the, the fortunate one that spent the most time with Doolittle. Would you describe the general, your thoughts on him? And I, I'm, I'm sure that I've read about it, the admiration that all of you people had for General Doolittle. But would you tell us what, how, how you felt about General Doolittle? How did you feel about? Uh, first off, uh, I, like I said before, I was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, uh, as a kid I would ride my bicycle over to a place called McCook Field, which was the uh, Army Air Corps first uh, test field, and consequently uh, uh, General Doolittle and uh, uh, the rest of the old timers uh, flew in and out of McCook Field. Uh, uh, and uh, he became one of my uh, childhood idols. Uh, and uh, uh, on the word that uh, it ended up where we got to fly with him was really a, a big deal as far as I was concerned personally. But uh, uh, Colonel Doolittle, uh, Aside from the fact that a lot of people thought that he was a big show-off, uh, having uh, flown all the mi missions that he flew and uh, winning, winning, winning all the trophies that he won, the real person was uh, very quiet. Uh, he uh, treated everybody with respect, and uh, he believed in the the the. Uh, idea of if you are in a crew that uh, the teamwork he, he was the team leader but uh, he gave everybody the option of uh, having their say about any questions that uh, affected the whole crew uh, he was also education oriented he had a college degree from california uh, and by studying uh, intermittently, uh, he ended up uh, getting the first doctor's degree in aeronautical engineering from uh, MIT. Uh, he, w he was very personable, uh, uh, and uh, everybody in the group was attracted to him. But he was. Uh, an inspiration, and uh, we were all happy that uh, he was our leader. Uh, Colonel, would <laughs> would you tell us a little bit about the twenty cent bomb site, the bomb site that you you used instead of the Norden bomb site, and why it was necessary? 
Uh, one of the crew, uh, uh, there was a, a young man by the name of Ross Greening. Uh, he, he was a, a very uh, mechanically minded uh, individual. And, and when uh, we were going, it was made, the decision was made we were going on a low level. Uh, we took the Norden bomb site out for a couple of reasons. It was extra weight, and uh, we also did not want it to fall in the hands of the Japanese. Uh, Ross figured out a, a little uh, aluminum-made deal with, with strictly nothing but a protractor uh, with a a pivot arm that you could move it up and down to different degrees. And uh, he tried it out and they were able to use it uh, uh, on the mission and it ended up costing uh, 25 cents. Yes, go ahead. If any of you want to see what one looks like, the one that's in the nose of Panchito here was actually manufactured by Horace Crouch, one of the Doodle Raider bombardiers, and given to me at the Raiders reunion back in 2002. And it was the same one used in their book. But the theory was a simple protractor with a, an angle. If you, they practiced it, and at a certain altitude and certain airspeed, they'd practice how far the bomb would travel before it hit the ground. And from there, you could calculate the angle that you need it. So if you can, as, as an example, if you can drop a 500 pound bomb from 1500 foot at 210 miles an hour, you would set it at 30 degrees. And uh, then just simply like tracking a rifle across the point, when your target came into the rifle site, you target a bomb or extremely effective Mark Twain bomb site. And by the way, the, the same gentleman that designed that is also the one that decided that being they didn't have tail guns, that they would uh, they would put broomsticks back there, painted black to, to, to deter the Japanese from attacking from the rear. So uh, that actually, they, there were no guns in the tail. There were just broomsticks sticking out the back. Book, uh, uh, book called Not as brief. Not as brief, right? Yes. That Colonel or, or Sergeant Thatcher, either one or both of you, that you encountered a good bit of. Uh, any aircraft and actually there was fighters flying around when you came, when you flew over Tokyo even though none of you got shot down is that correct I guess you saw a lot of any aircraft isn't that correct uh, actually uh, we had a little bit of advantage over the rest of the group because uh, even though we arrived over uh, Japan uh, first uh, they had just been, uh, had completed a uh, air raid exercise. And uh, one of the airplanes that uh, were in their inventory was a two-tailed airplane, uh, something like the B-25, called the Nell. Uh, and uh, as we flew over uh, the, uh, the island, People waved at us. Uh, we flew across uh, two or three baseball fields where they were playing baseball. And uh, uh, after we dropped our bombs, uh, we were uh, started to get the anti-aircraft. Uh, they was jostled us around a little bit, but uh, uh, like Dave said, it wasn't accurate. Uh, uh, after we dropped our bombs, we went back down on the uh, level and uh, flew out uh, uh, south of uh, Japan and because we didn't want uh, them to know we were turning toward China. And uh, it was maybe uh, 75 or 100 miles. We made it our turn and headed the southwest toward China. One thing that they mentioned in the book was that uh, prior to bailout, you were just giving out a fuel. What what were your thoughts? Are you in a storm? And before you, what were your thoughts for just before you bailed out? And you didn't know where you were, and uh, 
anyway, what were your, were your thoughts? Well, uh, I guess to set the picture was uh, you visualize, visualize yourself as uh, standing in an airplane at, uh, in the middle of a thunderstorm at night. Uh, and the thunderstorm was uh, very active, lots of bumpiness and uh, uh, lightning and so forth. Uh, and uh, looking down at the black hole that uh, was going to exit you into uh, a country where you had no idea where you were it was probably the scariest time. But uh, it turned out uneventful, and uh, all the crew uh, made it successfully. So it, you bailed out, and you were able to uh, reconnoiter, and all of all of your crew came back together. Would you describe uh, General Doolittle's thoughts about what his thoughts of how the raid went? Uh, after we bailed out, and each one of us spent our um, uh, the night, uh, we were all together the next day. Uh, I, I walked uh, uh, maybe uh, 15 or 20 miles, I guess, uh, and arrived over a cliff. Uh, uh, and this was about dusk at night. Uh, it had a Chinese nationalist flag flying over it, and I went down uh, to the uh, 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 building that the flag was flying on, and I was accosted by a young Chinese uh, soldier. Uh, he took me in the building, and, uh, uh, which was empty except for a table. Uh, the table was a uh, piece of paper with a two-tailed airplane uh, and five parachutes coming out of it. Uh, I finally got him to take me where he took the individual that made the sketch. And uh, I walked in the building and uh, there was uh, Colonel Doolittle. I, I said, boy, am I glad to see you. <laughs> Anyway, he greeted me and said he was happy that I wasn't injured. And uh, maybe a couple hours later, uh, uh, Chinese soldiers brought in uh, Hank Potter and uh, Fred Bramer and Paul Leonard. And so we were all together uh, that uh, night. Uh, the next morning, uh, the Chinese uh, took us to a place uh, uh, that uh, had a telephone. Uh, and uh, Colonel Doolittle's biggest worry was uh, he wanted to learn where everybody was if he could. And uh, it, it was a very difficult deal. But anyway, uh, the Chinese uh, decided they would take Paul Leonard, the crew chief, and do a little up to the crash site. So uh, they took off and went up, uh, was higher up on the mountain. Uh, and uh, as they were looking over the uh, debris, uh, Doolittle expressed to Paul that uh, uh, he might end up in Livingworth, having uh, lost all the airplanes and, and none of the uh, didn't know where the people were and so forth. And uh, finally, uh, Paul told him that, he, that uh, uh, they were going to promote him uh, to a brigadier general and he would get the, the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. And then Paul also added, uh, if they give you another airplane, I want to uh, be your crew chief. And uh, Doolittle personally expressed himself. He's, and he says, tears came to my eyes because that was the biggest compliment I've ever had.
there's a few little facts here that I thought I would end up with that I uh, thought you might be interested in. There was 80 men and 16 aircraft. One of them was killed in bailout. And he, it, as it turned out, it was Corporal Factor, and he was buried by Reverend John Birch, who the John Birch Society is uh, named after. And, and Reverend Birch, he was had, was in China and had been there for quite some time. He uh, Tex Hill knew him and the Flying Tigers. He had been associated with those people, but he was taken by the Red Chinese and he was tortured and murdered, and that's why that they have the, jo the they took it for the John Birch Society. Uh, eight of them. Uh, were captured, one died in prison, and three of them were executed. And I'm sure most of you have read that, and uh, it's, uh, it's horrible. Five made general later on. Four were POWs in Germany after that. Uh, and 13 of them died in other events in World War II. Uh, these gentlemen are to, to be greatly admired. Admiral Halsey made a statement, and he said it was the most courageous event in military history and it's uh now we're going to open it up for for some And as I, as I said before, uh, when we end the, our little question and answer, and if you'll allow the, the uh, gentlemen to escort them, our guards here, to escort them inside, and then we'll, we'll do the, uh, have the signing. Uh, so we're going to have, anybody have any questions back there? Yes, sir. I need one of those. Let me do it. Yeah, here, I need this one. I'll take this. Well, you'll need a... How come one aircraft ended up in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and was interned? Wanted to know about the one that flew to Russia, the aircraft that flew to Russia. Uh, had the fuel, had the carburetors that were adjusted uh, improperly. Uh, uh, the airplane that went to Russia had uh, excessive fuel uh, consumption and. Uh, uh, Ski York, who was the pilot, knew that he was never going to make it to China if he tried to keep on going uh, after he uh, bombed Japan. So he elected to go to uh, Russia. Uh, the, the flight to Russia was uneventful. He landed wheels down, except uh, when they landed, uh, they became a kind of a political pawn. Uh, and uh, they were put under house arrest uh, for uh, 14 months. Uh, they finally escaped uh, through uh, a few uh, Russian-made loopholes uh, in the Rand and got back to the States. You wanted to say something, Larry? Just one quick thing about the aftermath of the Doolittle Raid. And people say it was probably the most daring raid of World War II. But what it did, it was the turning point of the, world, of the war in, in the Pacific. The Japanese were hugely embarrassed by American bombers over within a mile of the Emperor's Palace and over their capital. It was a huge embarrassment. They had, they had lost face with the, with the Japanese people. They had to do something about it. It caused the Japanese then to pull back assets that weakened their other uh, aggressive uh, uh, postures in the Pacific. And caused they, by then they figured it had to be launched from aircraft carriers. So they wanted, they decided they had to find and sink the aircraft carriers that they missed at Pearl Harbor. Remember, the aircraft carriers were not in Pearl Harbor at the time of the Pearl Harbor raid. So they, they conceived the, the mission to take Midway to take Midway as a launching point to find the carriers uh, and wipe out the rest of the American fleet because their, their mission all along was to knock out the American fleet and then sue for peace on their terms to consolidate their empire. Well, by then we broke their code. We knew they were coming. Late ambush. 
sank four of their aircraft carriers within five minutes. Remember Torpedo Squadron 8 and Ensign George K. The entire squadron were lost except for one man. But that was a turning point. And from there on, there never was a major victory by the Japanese. The Coral Sea was basically a draw. The Hornet was sank at the Battle of Santa Cruz, never saw its first birthday because the Japanese by then had figured out that the Hornet was where the, Jap where the uh, Raiders had launched from, and they attacked it until they sank it. But the, the Doolittle Raid caused the Japanese to make strategic changes in their war plan that caused them to lose the war. It was the first domino to fall. And by the way, he mentions Ensign George Gay. Ensign George Gay was on the Hornet and saw, the, saw these gentlemen launch. So he had a uh, close association with these fellows. Another question. Okay. From what I understand, you couldn't get from the back of the plane to the front of the plane during the mission. And if not, what was it like back there and how many people were back there? I was the only one. <laughs> That's a long time. Uh, after, after we left Japan, then they used the gasoline out of that rubber collapsible tank and I was able to roll it to one side so I could curl up to the front then. Sergeant Thatcher. In the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, they showed the ruptured duck flying under the Golden Gate Bridge. Did you really do that? Did you really that fly under the, the, bridge? the Oakland Bay Bridge we flew under. Yes. I understand that the uh, Chinese civilians uh, pr uh, paid a pr terrible price uh, for helping. Uh, in that regard, was the raid worth it? He's talking about the, the, the Chinese, the, the number of Chinese that were are supposedly murdered after this for helping. Estimated that they killed 250,000, quarter of a million Chinese. At the, any village we went through, they found out and they would wipe out the whole population of the village. Did you intentionally uh, separate your planes uh, for safety factors? Uh, we did not go in in the formation, we went in alone. Well, they. The reason was is because they were they were departed. They would they didn't want to waste fuel by, you know, forming a forming. So they just they just proceeded. They were you know they were they were short on fuel to start off with. You know they 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 departed at 650 when it should have been 400 miles. They also were attacking five different cities, not just Tokyo. What is the normal takeoff distance for an unmodified B-25? Larry, you probably could answer that just as well. Well, you know, like many things, it's dependent on density altitude, it's dependent on your weight, your fuel load, everything. I could not imagine getting off in 500 foot in this airplane. Uh, but uh, lightly loaded, you know, we can get off probably in 1,000 or 1,500 feet. But you got to remember, I believe, Dick, you told me, Dick, you could point this out because you, you told me when we were doing the uh, Military Channel series, what was the speed of the carrier and then the, the wind in the steam? I believe you said you had about 60 knots of wind across the deck before you even rolled. At another point, every airplane took off from the same spot. You know, the last airplane didn't have any further. They all had to taxi up to the same spot because the island been in the middle of the boat. You couldn't risk hitting the island and blocking the deck. So everyone had to come up and took off in the exact same spot. But Dick, could you point out or talk about the, the amount of wind you had across the deck before you started your roll? Uh, we talked about that, and uh, we figured that we probably would, could be airborne by, with about 20 knots. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember what the speed of the carrier was, but the wind was around 30, 35 knots. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Well, we've only got two guys here right together. Let's just do them here. I, I'm from uh, Japan, and uh, I was a college student uh, chopping wood on top of a mountain when you, uh, it was Kiki Peninsula, and you were 
following uh, the, the you were following the river upward toward uh, uh, Osaka, and uh, we didn't know you were American planes. We thought uh, uh, we'd never see an American plane at that time, but then we learned later. Much to our, we are very ashamed. Um, not really a question, but just one thing. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Cole, Sergeant Thatcher, it's been a great honor for me to do this. Uh, I've admired you for years. I was only, I was born in 1933, but I remember the raid just like it was yesterday. And it's been a great honor. Thank, thank you. Thanks all you folks for coming. And uh, they'll be over on the other side over here. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>